Hello. We are announcing our 100,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. Special thanks to Galaxy Sabers for sponsoring this giveaway. We're giving away the Luke Skywalker Episode 6 lightsaber, Darth Maul, and the Vanguard lightsaber. All the details and pin comment down below, so make sure you go down there and sign up for the giveaway. I'll be announcing which video the giveaway will be in, in the community tab on the main page on the channel. Thank you all for getting us to this point, and I'll see you guys at 100k. Our story begins on Mustafar. Obi-Wan and Anakin were interlocked in a tense standoff. Their blades were being flung at the others to try to keep a safe distance. They held each other at bay on a small platform over top the lava river. The duel had gone on for so long and it was coming to a breaking point. At one moment or another, Skywalker or Kenobi would be killed. Obi-Wan found a couple of moments where he believed he could have made the kill. He didn't take the shot for two reasons. The first one being that he still didn't want to kill Anakin, and the second one being that if he made the strike, chances are, he'd end up dying or losing a piece of himself in the process. Their blades continued until they spoke to each other after separating from their duel. According to Anakin, the Jedi were evil, and Palpatine was good. It was so convoluted, but he was slowing down. Obi-Wan was still trying to reason with him, but there was no reasoning as it seemed. Skywalker pressed harder and their blades continued to meet in the middle again. Once they came around to the lava banks, Obi-Wan was able to dismount and find a safe place to land. He looked down and saw Anakin looking up at him. This was it. Obi-Wan could end the fight right here. But at the same time, he didn't want to. When he looked at Skywalker, all he saw was the little boy he raised from Tatooine. Killing him wouldn't be right, and it would be a continuation of his obvious failure to keep the promise to Master Qui-Gon. Kenobi looked down and told Anakin that it was over. He had the high ground. Anakin was so focused on the fight itself that he lost track of everything. He looked up at his master. A wave of confusion rushed through him. His master clearly trying to end this fight without killing him and all the rage that had been present within Skywalker sat idle for a moment. The dark side gave him so much power and he wouldn't let go of that. However, he was just confused now. He looked down at the lightsaber. While Obi-Wan was hopeful that Anakin would concede the fight, he had little faith that he would. Skywalker was too impatient to just give up like that, so there had to be some sort of catch here. Kenobi watched Anakin look at the bottom of the river and he took a deep breath. He didn't know how much more of this he could take. It obviously wasn't the safest place to dismount for Skywalker, but Anakin shuffled off the platform onto the bottom of the river. Obi-Wan raised his hands and told Anakin to get out of it, stop doing this to himself. Anakin slipped on the banks as he landed, his boots barely slipping above the lava. He grabbed the riverbed but continued to slip. A slight panic set in as he realized he was motionless. Anakin turned his head towards his master and Obi-Wan shook his head. Anakin looked down and then deep netted his lightsaber and threw it up the side of the lava bed towards Obi-Wan's boots. The fight was a stalemate, and right here in this moment, Obi-Wan had the opportunity to end the entire fight. He could have killed him, but he didn't. Was it Obi-Wan being a Jedi, or was it something more? He was unsure. All he knew is that Kenobi could have shoved him into the lava. He could have speared him in the face with his lightsaber. There were a multitude of ways in which Anakin could have been killed, and yet Obi-Wan spared him. Like he saw there was still light in him or something. Obi-Wan pulled Anakin up just enough before releasing his grip on him, and then he grabbed a hold of Anakin's lightsaber and watched him slowly walk up the side of the lava bed. Obi-Wan backpedaled and asked Anakin if he was done. Were they finished here? Anakin took a deep breath and looked at his master and shrugged his shoulders. After all their fighting, he was exhausted. They both were. It was such a simple moment, but Anakin realized in the stalemate, in the near loss in this battle, that perhaps all of it was for nothing. Anakin believed that with all of his new powers, he should be able to save Padme. But in this rare moment of self-realization, he figured that the dark side didn't do him much. If he was truly all that powerful and that much stronger, then surely he could have beaten Obi-Wan. But here he was, just like a Padawan, getting shown up by his master. He felt like a fool truthfully. How could Obi-Wan beat him? He killed Syndralic and assassinated Shaak T. What else was he supposed to do? But the reality set in. He could have done what he did anyways without the dark side. All the Jedi inside the temple were priests, monks, teachers, archivists, and so forth. Very few of them were warriors, and the few that were warriors never even got near him. Actually, in hindsight, whatever happened to the temple guards? He only saw a couple of them. Anakin just looked at his master and told him that all he wanted to do was save his wife. Obi-Wan looked down with so much disappointment. He knew that Anakin couldn't have said that out loud to anyone to the council, but what he did was so against him as a person. He had spikes in anger, but seriously, how could he do that? Anakin wasn't stupid. He knew how many of those younglings looked up to him, and he slaughtered them all like they weren't even sentient. It was despicable. Kenobi didn't say a word. He didn't forgive Anakin. He still loved him. As convoluted as it sounded, he just couldn't hate Anakin. Though forgiving him was such a hard thing to grasp at the moment. Anakin turned back to the lava and spoke aloud, telling his former teacher how sorry he was for what he did. All of his actions were heinous, but the reality is, he couldn't undo it. He had to live with his actions. Kenobi couldn't speak. He just looked to the ground and then turned towards the lava river. They could hear creaking in the distance. 
Kenobi thought about saying something, but what was there to say? Every time he said something when Anakin was training, it went in one ear and out the other. He couldn't listen to just about anything. This was a path he had to face on his own. Kenobi then remembered that Padme was still on the platform. He was about to go back and make sure she was alright when Anakin called Obi-Wan's name. He asked his master if he could help him. Kenobi turned back and asked what he meant. Anakin let out some air and said that he messed up, but there was a darkness coming. He needed help. He then pointed to the sky as the Emperor's shuttle descended. Skywalker told his master that they had to make it look like a fight. Obi-Wan didn't trust that at all. He was literally going to use his master to take advantage of him. That would not happen. Kenobi shook his head. He told Anakin that if he wanted to fight the Emperor together, then he would go in first. There was no way he would dare put himself between Anakin and Sidious. Truthfully, Kenobi assumed Anakin was telling the truth, but he also noticed something Skywalker didn't catch on to, so it didn't matter. He would take advantage of that. Anakin agreed to Obi-Wan's decision as he was tossed his lightsaber. Kenobi backed away, giving Anakin room to move past him towards the landing zone the Emperor docked at. The location of the Emperor's docking yard wasn't connected to the one where Padme and 3PO were. That one was sitting just outside the main foundry. Skywalker waited eagerly for his new instructor, as Sidious walked across the sulfur and ash. The heat of the planet was chilled by the evil within his chest as he got close to Anakin and asked if he had finished his mission. Anakin nodded his head and then ignited his weapon. He swung forward and his blade would stop right above Sidious's head. He smiled at Skywalker and used the force to throw him backwards. Anakin slammed down into the sulfur as he looked back to see Sidious ignite his lightsaber and storm forward. Anakin was petrified for a short moment. How was the Dark Lord this powerful? Kenobi knew that Yoda was likely dead upon seeing Anakin hit the ground the way he did. He quickly helped Skywalker up and Sidious saw Kenobi. He noted that Obi-Wan was weak for helping someone who had just destroyed his order, but it was a testament to the Jedi way. Kenobi knew he was stuck, but alas, if he, Skywalker, and Sidious died, then perhaps it would be better for the greater galaxy. No more Jedi, no more Sith. Maybe it was better than a galaxy with either in it. Kenobi stood next to Anakin as they both prepared for a confrontation that would consume them all. The three of them stood at odds until Sidious lunged at them. A battle began and their blades quickly moved. Anakin and Obi-Wan were winded by the fight they'd already been through. Sidious had enough time to recover due to the flight through hyperspace. Their blades collided and they moved at the speed of light. Sidious focused on both of his opponents, dragging and thrusting, never hitting the right mark as he continued to try and push one of them to the brink of death. It truthfully was like fighting Yoda, just in the form of two opponents. They made up for each other's weaknesses. Anakin's weak defense and Obi-Wan's weak offense. Sidious couldn't just defeat them the way he did the unsuspecting CC-10 and Agon Kolar. He needed to separate them. Their blades masked the sounds of the lava volcanoes exploding in the background. It was light versus dark for the second time, even though dark was fighting with light. The fate of the galaxy was hanging in the balance, and then the snap. Despite Kenobi's focus on the battle, his ears were open for the sound of the snap. The most of our facility had been torn apart on the inside. The landing bay was disconnected from the main platform, and it was slipping into the river. When it dropped, it dropped hard. The entire structure, aside from the landing platform, collided into the lava river, creating a massive tsunami of hot liquid magma. The lava crested dozens of feet into the air, the river becoming a monstrous wave that sped towards them. The two clones who were watching the fight were consumed with fear and then burnt to pieces in the span of seconds. Sidious made his way for higher ground as Obi-Wan grabbed Anakin's wrist. Anakin was doing the same, trying to get to higher ground, but Obi-Wan knew they wouldn't outrun the lava as it was speeding towards them. He told Anakin to trust him. Despite everything they had gone through, despite everything Anakin did to Obi-Wan, they needed to be brothers as one in this moment. Sidious turned back, scaling for higher ground as fast as he could, only to watch Obi-Wan and Anakin consumed by the lava river. He chuckled, but the lava river was getting close to him. In his panic, he climbed an active volcano that he didn't know was active, and it burst sending him backwards as the lava river consumed him into a fiery pit of pain and misery. Inside the lava tsunami, Anakin and Obi-Wan were back to back. Their hands held outwards as they used all their strength, all of their energy, and everything they had left within them to push the lava away from them, creating a safe bubble around them. They were both struggling, but because they had each other in this moment, they could keep the lava from crushing down on them and killing them. After what was only 15 minutes but felt like hours, the lava river receded back into place and they were free. The two of them fell down to the ground inside the little bubble they created for themselves, both of them heaving heavily, before helping up the other and making their way back to the landing zone. Was Sidious dead? They were unsure, but the darkness that plagued the planet seemed to be absent, so perhaps he was. Anakin thanked Obi-Wan for helping him stay alive. Kenobi nodded his head and didn't say much. When they got back to the ship, he made sure Padme was alright, before taking Anakin's starfighter and disappearing. There were only few words that could be shared between the two of them. Anakin was so appreciative for Obi-Wan, he saved both their lives, from sparing his life at the bottom of the lava river, to his strategy against Sidious, to the lava tsunami, 
He saved them, though he wanted no thanks. He wanted nothing, just to be left alone. He loved Anakin with all of his heart. Obviously, that was true. He saved his life after having spent several minutes trying to defend himself from Anakin. However, despite the love he had for his boy, he couldn't bear even look him in the eyes. The atrocious sins he bore were all Obi-Wan could see anymore. Anakin knew it too. It was no longer Anakin Skywalker, it was Darth Vader wearing Anakin Skywalker's face. As Yoda said, the boy he trained was gone, so Obi-Wan just left. More defeated than he likely would have been had he actually killed Anakin. But again, it was a true testament to not just the Jedi, but the man that Obi-Wan was. He didn't seek revenge when Qui-Gon died. He didn't seek revenge when Satine died. He didn't seek revenge when his order and all of his friends were slaughtered. He was the strongest of the Jedi, and it only made the burden of pain worse for Skywalker. He could have yelled, he could have screamed, he could have cursed him out, and yet there were not even words to be shared. It was worse than being told he was disappointed in him. He broke something with an Obi-Wan, whether it be his spirit or his heart, he was unsure, but now he had to live with knowing he did that to him. Padme would give birth on Naboo with little to no complications. She'd be grateful to see Anakin there, and he thought he had escaped the turmoil of his actions. It all felt like a dream for a moment, but it wouldn't be that easy for him. She would remember and remember, and then it would all click, and then she wished she hadn't. He realized the consequences of his actions would be staring him in the face. Just as they had with his disappeared master, she looked at him with a gaze of terror and disappointment. Like Obi-Wan, she loved him. She was happy he was here, but he murdered children. He slaughtered the entire temple. So many of those Jedi were just innocent. Maybe they were loyal to the code, but they were simply just that. Priests and teachers and children and archivists. No amount of apologies could bring them back, and they were gone for good. What would Anakin do about it? A conversation Padme had with her sisters and mother would lead them to completely disregard everything they loved about Anakin within moments. They could only look at him with fear. Padme's father, per the request of the mother of his grandchildren, would request Anakin to stay away from the family for a little while. Padme needed time to process everything. Those little complications she had in birth resurfaced, and they became large complications. She was so incredibly in love with him that loving someone who did so much wrong and so much against her own moral code ripped her heart to shreds. Anakin had to live with his actions. What was he supposed to do now? His best friends were gone. Ahsoka was probably dead. Who knows where Obi-Wan went, and his wife did want to see him. So he figured he would try and make it right. It would take time to confirm the death of the Emperor so Anakin would make sure they knew he was gone. His reign of terror could come to an end, and they could fix everything. That was the worst thing he could do. Allowing the Republic to draw out the process a little longer would have saved them time. The Separatist movement, while surrendering, was initially going to reunite with the Empire. Now they had every reason to break free again. As for the power gap left behind, according to Skywalker with the Emperor dead, it meant that a non-democratic system would vie for power, and those closest to Palpatine would do just that. Masameda, being so close to the Emperor, wanted to seize control over the Senate, so he called for the execution of Order 72, which required the Senate to be taken over so the highest individual in power could seize control of a lost state. Considering Masameda was assigned to the role of advisor of the Empire shortly before Sidious' death, he took advantage of it. However, Admiral Tarkin believed he was closer to the Emperor, and so with Masameda beating him to the punch, he deployed the 501st, considering it was already on planet, outfitting the troopers with Executive Order 49. It was the ability for any military leader, captain, and up, to take control of the Galactic Republic, or in this case, Empire, with hostility due to the government being too corrupt for its own good. What ensued was what Anakin could see as a bloodbath. He was hopeful that telling the Senate about Palpatine would make them come together and reinstate the Republic, but what ensued was a civil war. The Clone Wars may have ended, but now the executive orders that Sidious had expertly used were being used against the clones. 501st versus Coruscant Guard, and because there was a fight, every single governmental official present at the Senate building was seen as an agitator. The slaughter was horrendous, and it completely crippled the Republic military presence on Coruscant. Thousands of clones were killed in the battle that ensued. The 501st did triumph over the Coruscant Guard, but because the Coruscant Guard wasn't all stationed at the Senate building, they had reinforcements and they knew the layout much better. So they were able to use guerrilla warfare tactics on the elite unit and rip them to hundreds of survivors. Anakin tried to stop the conflict once it started, but he was clipped in the shoulder and had to retreat. Both units of clones saw him as an agitator for trying to disrupt each unit's set of executive orders. Thanks to Executive Order 150, the clones' inhibitor chips would be shut off, but it wouldn't reduce the amount of damage done to the Republic. Anakin was even more so horrified at what he had done, so he had to figure out what to do now. Instead of running away from his problems, he would do the right thing. He wouldn't mess up the way he just had, he would try and do something right. So he went to the temple. There were a couple thousand Jedi who'd been killed inside the structure, most with blaster, but a good number with lightsaber. Anakin slowly but surely made his way through the temple, picking up the bodies of the dead and burying them as all the Jedi were. It started to reek inside the temple too, so he moved quickly 
putting their bodies in the caskets and dropping them down below the temple, where their flesh would be reduced to ash and they would transcend into the living forest. He spent hours upon hours until his bones felt weak from carrying adults big and small to their final resting place. When he felt he should take a break, he refused. He pushed himself to continue until every individual had their final rest. As he got to the younglings, he couldn't bring himself to do it. He brought all the adults first because they were heavier and he knew it would be easier to bring the young once he was finished with the old. Carrying shock, T was one of the worst experiences of his life. She was so kind to everyone. She was so respected and just killed her without even letting her speak. She was in a peaceful meditation, only noticing anything when the doors opened. He laid her to rest with tears in his eyes. But when it came time to bring the younglings in, he was bawling his eyes. Who had he become? All of what he did was for nothing. He killed so many for no reason. Padme had no complications and it was because of him that all these people were dead. He could shift the blame, he could point fingers, but at the end of the day, it came down to him looking himself in the mirror, because he had to go to the distance to do what he did. Anakin lamented every moment of this. He carried the children, each of them, to their final resting place, and once the last one was buried, he slipped down into the corner and held his hands over his eyes. He was drenched in sweat and he couldn't even cry anymore. He had tears in his eyes for a good part of the day, and now he was empty. He just couldn't imagine what it was like for them. He put himself into their shoes for a minute. It was a peaceful night, just like any other. He imagined the teachers instructing their final lessons before the chaos started. He imagined the younglings awoken from their sleep. He thought of individuals deep in meditation to never come out. Anakin was grateful the Emperor was dead. But what now? The Republic was in shambles. He heard someone walking around the temple and he got up quickly, hopeful that someone had arrived and survived. He found a man wearing temple gear, and he turned to Skywalker asking if he had been the one responsible for the Emperor's death. Anakin nodded his head with a sense of jubilee, but the Grand Inquisitor wasn't happy about the death of his new master. His lightsaber ignited and he sped towards Anakin. He was so weak and fragile after lifting dead weight all day, and he quickly pulled his weakened arms up to defend himself. A duel transpired for the longer part of several minutes. Anakin was very defensive and Grand Inquisitor couldn't see that. He watched Anakin the entire time. He waited until Anakin was weakest before he pounced. Skywalker did everything he could to defend himself, and in the final moment, his blade struck true, which meant he had to bury yet another Jedi. What a hard experience this was for him. He never wanted to go through this again. As it turns out, that was entirely within his control. So Anakin did what he had heard about, but wasn't entirely sure about. He took a small hollow recorder and prepared a message, handing it off to a surviving astromech and sending it back to Naboo before he vanished. He would take a bearish vow and disappear in the galaxy. The astromech would deliver the message to Padme and her family. There was an initial message for Padme, which was, he wanted to tell her that he wanted to fix himself and make things right. If she wanted to contact him, she had his personal frequency here but she would never be able to get a hold of him. He wouldn't have access with the rest of the galaxy until he fully understood himself and his emotions. So Skywalker would choose the planet of Osis as his base of operations. It was connected to the Force, and he would be able to find comfort in it without distractions of the wider galaxy. He would stay and last for about a year and a half, and while he was here, the galaxy changed. Osis was peaceful, and Anakin was able to reflect on his greatest errors and mistakes. He was able to see where he went wrong, and he was constantly haunted by nightmares. The biggest plague to his mind, despite Obi-Wan and Padme, was whether or not Ahsoka survived. He knew that Padme would be alright and Obi-Wan too, but he was worried about his little sister and if she had survived that purge. Anakin did eventually find some peace within himself. It was deep in a meadow on Osis and it was under a willow tree. It was the most peaceful place in the galaxy and his heart was filled with peace for perhaps the first time in his life. Outside of Anakin's Osis Sanctuary, the galaxy effectively divided into two separate forms of government. The Separatist movement refurbished his name into the Parliament of Independent Systems, otherwise known as PIS. <laughs> On the other hand, the Republic rebuilt without faceless corporations ruling their government. Considering many of the individuals that died during the miniature civil war were members of these businesses, they were too hesitant to jump back in when the Republic was rebuilt after ripping down the Imperial name. When they tried to get on board, the Republic halted them. It was a gilded Republic, a new era for the people of the galaxy. Truthfully, there was still some bad blood between the Republic and Parliament of Independent Systems, but it never devolved into war. The clones were taken care of. After it was found out through a thorough investigation that they were being used for Palpatine's ascent to power, they were given a chance at a new life. The Jedi were also given amnesty, but no one had heard of them since the Night of Order 66. The clones were the main force of the Republic, and while there wasn't any war in the Outer Rim, the day would come when they would join the Parliament of Independent Systems and take down the crime syndicates, including Darth Maul, the last of the Sith. The Jedi, on the other hand, were grouping up, but one decided against his better judgment to find those who survived the Purge. He and Yoda never saw each other again. The Grand Master assumed he died on Mustafar and went into exile. When Bail Organa found Obi-Wan, he couldn't get a hold of Master Yoda. 
Obi-Wan was technically the Grand Master, but he didn't want to use that title. It was very hard for him to become this renowned leader of the Order. Those who survived the Purge, from inside the temple, held a deep resentment for him, being that his student caused so much havoc. For children, it was hard to understand, because the trauma was too great. Obi-Wan never tried to make excuses for it. As a Jedi, Anakin's failure was his failure. He was able to round up 60 or so Jedi in the meantime, and brought them to Tython so they could have a fresh start. It wasn't much, and there wasn't much he could do. He could try and teach them the way he survived his greatest losses, but in the process of doing that, he realized how far from the code he was at times too, coming to the realization that the curse of the Jedi Order was their tight allegiance to the Jedi Code. He decided that he would forego the code until a future time, just so they could focus on rebuilding what had been lost. He wore a lot of the pain and stress on his face, but he did have a friend he was grateful for. Ahsoka returned to the Order to help him. She wasn't technically a Jedi, but after learning about what happened to Anakin, she didn't feel it was right to leave Obi-Wan all alone. He had Coleman Cash, Jocasta Nu, and Terra Sanube, but he wasn't as close to them as he was with her. Padme, on the other hand, was able to recover from her pregnancy-related complications. She'd actually been sending messages to Anakin on the daily. She believed that the man she fell in love with would come back to her, so it became almost like a daily diary, if you will. She'd record a message and send it to Anakin's transponder. He would see it whenever the time was right for him to return to the galaxy. The best part about this is that when Anakin eventually did see it, he would know how much his wife still loved him. She would, especially in the beginning, go on long tangents about how disappointed and angry she was, but each talk would end with the word love. It wasn't directly said in the form of I love you, but it was a way for him to know that she was working on trying to come around. It was truthfully much harder for her than it was for him, but all of his work was internal. He was working on himself. She was trying to believe and trust that he wouldn't go mental on her or their family. So that was a big issue for her. Luke and Leia were doing well though, and they were at the age where they couldn't really tell what was going on. They had their family, Padme's parents and her sisters, so it was a benefit to them anyways. At the end of Anakin's bearish vow, he listened to every single message his wife sent him, and he would wait for the following day. When the time came, she called, and he answered and they'd have a long, heartfelt conversation. He had already cried about the messages he got, being that they conveyed he was still loved by her, though this conversation was all sorts of difficult. But the bright side was learning that the twins were doing well, and Padme was okay. He was okay too, so it made an already on-edge reunion feel all the more welcoming. It would be difficult, accepting Anakin back into her life was hard, but they slowly made it work. Obviously, there was always a broken trust or faith for her, and that would never vanish. At the very back of her mind, she'd always worry about what he would do and if he would do it again. But the way he was when he returned was like Anakin before the war, before the Tatooine incident. He was loving and kind, he showed no hostility. It was a joyful innocence. The nightmare still haunted him, and even her, but he was happier and more at peace than ever before. Skywalker would have this chance to interact with Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, but that was a bit difficult, Ahsoka holding more resentment than Obi-Wan did. This was mostly because of what she watched Obi-Wan go through over the past year or so since she rejoined the Order. With Obi-Wan in charge though, the Order was in good hands. While Anakin would never escape his actions, he would make up for it when the Republic and Parliament went into the Outer Rim. It was by his blade that he killed Maul, and it would be by him and Commander Cody who destroyed the last of the criminal organizations as both governments took back the Outer Rim. It was a gradual process, but just like the rebuilding of the Jedi Order, it would bring hope to a new generation of people in the new galaxy. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Annika Stank Runner, Cullen Rooney, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galaxy 666, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Lexi Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you're supporting me other ways. Go check out the Patreon, early access to the Sith Clone Wars out every Saturday, and early access to some cool animations like this one on screen right here. Don't forget to go down below, the giveaway will be going on to 100,000 subscribers. It will not be mentioned in the 100,000 subscriber special, it will be in one of the videos afterwards. Anyways, let's talk about the story. The idea of getting Anakin the turn during the fight, I feel like was really hard to do and convey, and so I felt like it needed to be a life or death situation. And it couldn't be Obi-Wan almost killing Anakin. I think it had to be a moment where Anakin slipped up and almost killed himself, because if Obi-Wan did it, he'd probably get angrier. So in that process, Obi-Wan saving him, he would realize, oh, maybe, maybe there's still something left within me. Maybe I shouldn't be a maniac. And so it's that slight turn. But I also wanted to convey like him actually dealing with the responsibilities of his actions. 
And I think this was probably the best way we've done it so far, where he actually goes to the temple and buries the bodies and, and tries to do something wrong. And he's so far down the path that he ends up doing like the inverse of what he's trying to do and he ends up causing more damage to the Republic. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you, I spread the love and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.